It is my pleasure today to chair the next, next panel, Ancestral Futures, uh, featuring three really inspiring uh, practitioners. Um, I was asked to briefly introduce myself as well first. Uh, my name is Nina Kolovratnik. I'm an architect and PhD student in uh, human and modern human rights law at Ghent University, um, trying to understand the translational processes at work when indigenous um, truths enters the inter-American uh, human rights system uh, in the form of evidence. Um, also working um, with a case study in Ecuador um, on which uh, where indigenous people in voluntary uh, or in isolation are threatened by oil industries, people who can't speak for themselves in court since they refuse contact um, with the majority society. Um, I want to go ahead now and introduce our speakers um, and in short their contributions. Um, Ignacio Acosta is a Chilean-born artist, um, a researcher uh, who works with photography and uh, video in territories under pressure from extractivist industries. Uh, he's a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Center for Multidisciplinary Studies on Racism in Uppsala University, Finland, where he leads the collaborative research project Indigenous Perspective perspectives uh, on forest fires, drought and climate change, Sampi. Uh, he's also a research associate uh, at the Royal College of Art as part of um, the research project Solid Waters, Frozen Time, Future Justice, Photography and Mining in the Andean Glaciers. Ignacio will present us uh, with his film uh, from Mars to Venus, Activism of the, fut uh, of the Future, a work on two indigenous territories seemingly far apart, uh, yet both under threat from human-made environmentalist damage uh, and the so-called green economy, uh, with a particular interest, um, I believe, in the local community's responses. Um, we're looking forward to that. And he will then also um, discuss it a little bit with us. Um, the then we have uh, Godofreo Pereira. Uh, he's an architect and researcher. Um, he's the head of program for DMA uh, in environmental architecture at uh, Royal College of Art. Um, for the past decade, Godofreo uh, Pereira has been conducting research. Uh, he has been publishing, exhibiting on environmental architecture and collective uh, politics. Um, his doctoral research investigated political and territorial conflicts within the planetary race for underground resources. Uh, at Forensic Architecture, he led the Atacama Desert Project, and currently, um, among other, he's developing research at the, um, on the lithium triangle across uh, Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. Uh, and he's working on the book Ex Humus, uh, and uh, the project scales of climate justice. <laughs> He's busy. Um, <laughs> Godofredo will talk uh, to us about um, his work, uh, so, oh no, the, the investigative work done by local communities, uh, academics and artists in, in contesting the extractivist gaze that reduces territories such as the Puna de Atacama, a highland region across uh, Chile, Bolivia and Argentina, uh, to the mineral uh, resources. Um, our last speaker will be Gabriela Sanja Silva. Uh, she's a Brazilian uh, UK based art uh, practitioner and educator and a researcher specializing in education and socially engaged uh, practices. She's uh, also a PhD candidate uh, at the uh, exhibition research lab uh, at Liverpool, John Moores University. Uh, between 2007 um, and 2018, she has been working as a coordinator in the uh, Mercosur uh, Biennial and the Liverpool Biennial, um, and as a guest creator of the uh, Biennial um, of the Biennale de Sao Paulo in 2018. Um, she will present um, the narrative strands of the exhibition. Uh, we live like trees inside the footsteps of our ancestors. Um, 
exploring uh, human nature relationships, um, what comes after uh, exploitation and voices of resilience. So um, I'm happy to give the floor to Ignacia Costa. Um, this project is a conversation between two indigenous territories that are key to the so-called green energy transition. Um, so we, in one hand, we have Kiruna in northern Sweden and home to the Sami people and the Atacama in northern Chile and home to the Likanantai people. This work has been developed and in close collaboration with activists living and working in these areas.
And then it's time for us to go underground. And here we have special tags too. And that's for security so that the mining company knows exactly where we are when we are underground. So welcome underground. The Sami are an indigenous minority whose traditional ancestral land of Sapme has been colonized and is currently divided between the nations the states of Finland, Norway, Sweden, and the Kola Peninsula in Russia. I have been visiting Swedish Sapme since 2017 through the Drone Vision Project. During Elitia Goapta, or Drones and Drums, I explored the use of drone technologies as a tool of minority indigenous resistance to the proposed Galang mining operation in Yokmok. So this project is, explores the relationship between technology and tradition in the context of the Sami culture. And um, while the drum allows the Noadi or shaman to travel between material and spiritual worlds, the drones uh, permit us to grasp the scale of the territory through extending our field of vision. So um, this is the follow-up project. Um, is our current project called Forest Fires Sami Stories um, that began in 2018 um, with Forest Fires when collaborator and friend, Sami a journalist and documentary, Liz Marie Nielsen and I helped cooking for the firefighters in the local Lukmuk. Um, school. So today we, together with um, Gun Aira, um, um, Asami Rendia Herde, and teacher and translator, um, and a feminist professor and environmental um, historian, Maybrit Oman, we're working on a four year project about um, indigenous perspectives of forest fires and, um, based in, in, in Uppsala University. This is um, the project I'm speaking about uh, today. Um, it's um, titled um, From Mars to Venus Activism of the Future. Um, and this is a conversation that began as a following an animistic belief uh, that mineral rich mountains and deserts can communicate because of their strong powers their ore possesses. So, as a core a concept of the alchemy, is based on symbolic associations between both planet and metal. So iron is a hard and penetrable material and that resembles uh, the hostile aggression of Mars. And um, in the other hand, we have um, Venus that resonates with the glow of Polish copper, a softer and more malleable metal conductor of heat. So the project connects these two places, Kiruna, hope to the largest iron mine. Um, and in the video becomes uh, Mars, 
and then in the Atacama, with its rich, very rich copper deposits, becomes Venus. So as such, um, the video proposes that the keeping traditional knowledge, um, despite the territorial disintegration caused by such a colonialism, is also a powerful um, act of resistance. Um, as such, this is sustained silence or slow resistance to the gradual degradation caused by mining industries is a fundamental aspect of the video narrative. Um, as such, I began the project by filming the scale of the territorial transformation of mining. And uh, by the end of the project with um, editor Lara Garcia Reyn, it uh, became clear that the focus was more on how indigenous activists resist um, the slow violence. Uh, Rick Robin Nixon defines uh, a violence that is delayed of destruction that is dispersed across time and space of the mining industries by maintaining their cultural practices and indigenous knowledges and an increasingly fragmented territory. I see we we see um, in the video uh, uh, the activist Karen Lusa in a caring re relationship with the rescue horses or Likanantai uh, activist Carola Aguirres Cruz uh, fighting to maintain traditional herding in the fragile ec ecosystem of the desert against the bad crop of masterism, green energy production and mining. The sound designer and composer Udi Duzeya, um, who came to Kiruna to record sounds from the field, also tries to replicate this sonic dimension of violence in the through the sound composition of the of the piece. Um, so as such, we see um, in in this case Carola Aguirres Cruz, but we also see um, Maiduris Rimpi, an 80 years old Lulia Sami pioneer, an artist and respected elder. Um, knowledge holder in a caring relationship um, with the reindeer um, while cleaning the reindeer source of food. This careful indigenous practice takes place um, of Maiduris takes place in her, her home in Pareyanka, very near Porius, one of the 15 hydrological dams that disrupt the Lule River and are managed by a state-owned energy company, Vasterfall. Gunaira claims that large-scale hydropower logging and clearing has shrunk the winter grazing of the reindeer, meaning that forest rich in lichen, traditional good for grazing, have declined by 71% in Sweden. So indeed, indigenous people's land use practices leave a small ecological footprint, but are the most uh, exposed of the impacts of climate change. In Kiruna, where state and just pol state policies reiterate colonial patterns, the iron mining industry has historically occupied the traditional lands of the Sami and affected reindeer herding patterns. Um, Sami artists and healers Osa Anderson and Jane Silnio conducted a ceremony becoming reindeer thinking fish on the Lusoyarbi Lake, which has been almost emptied by the Swedish state mining corporation LKB, and against the backdrop of Europe's largest deposit of rare earth minerals. So the video um, installation drops up of the scales of these operations by connecting territorial struggles concerning water, biodiversity, and identity loss with the space observation. My bit almost suggests large areas of reindeer grazing land have been lost to, and the former land-based reindeer migration now in many areas has to be conducted by lorry transportation. So while international media, for example, celebrates the corporate location of the mining town of Kiruna, where communities of over 3,000 families have been forcibly displaced with unfair compensation. This is occurring because the iron mine is destabilizing the grounds, and as, as a result, um, the old city is sinking. In Chile and Sweden, and many other nation states, extraction takes place um, within territories where indigenous people reside and conduct their traditional economic activities. While around 40% of the world's copper is produced in Chile, Chile has also the highest number of record conflicts related to mining in Latin America. So amongst the many conflicts that have arisen are the proactive legal battles involving on one hand, 
the big multinational corporations that control 70% of Chilean copper output, and the other, the indigenous and agricultural communities are struggling with growing desertification, water contamination, and land expropriation. So in the Atacama, the natural environment or the ecology is sacrificed in the name of progress. Historically, copper and more recently lithium extraction activities are drying up subterranean aquifers. As the current activist Karen Lusa says, the lithium extraction process extracts and evaporates the water because this is how the lithium extraction process works and thus evaporates and evaporates more and more water. So indeed, the transition to a green economy, such as solar and wind power battery, storage and electric vehicles, is based on the claim that a substantial uh, increase in extraction is necessary to meet the material needs of renewable energy technologies and associated infrastructure. Indeed, indigenous peoples are suffering the consequences from the set of colonial practices, abuse and exploitation in the territories that disfavors indigenous peoples and put further pressure on their survival, for both physically and mentally. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for the invitation and the opportunity to be here speaking a bit about the work. Thank you for organizing uh, this event, first and foremost, and for all the opportunities of conversations and, and alliances that it's allowed for already and hopefully continues allowing. Um, at 10 minutes, so it's, I'll try to make it uh, as short as possible, and then hopefully we can tease out a few points in the conversation. Um, so uh, my work on, on, on anti-extractivism is transversal in nature, sometimes around, mostly around writing uh, or activism based in Portugal, uh, but also a lot of it around research, uh, mostly throughout different sites in, uh, in Latin America. Um, and over a decade or so, I was engaged uh, in multiple different projects uh, and research engagements in, uh, in the Atacama Desert. Uh, both individually and collectively um, in different guises, and, well, I can't go to that. Um, and so I thought, so I, I thought that today maybe it's worth starting by one of those projects, or at least one of those concerns, which was uh, with the lithium triangle, um, which is a triangle, as in the image then I kind of noted in there, formed in the minds of mining uh, corporations and supporting states by the three different salt flats uh, in Argentina, Bolivia, uh, and Chile, uh, called Uyuni, uh, Hombre Muerto, and Atacama. And those three major salt flats, therefore three major deposits of, uh, of lithium, uh, lead to this construction of this geography, the lithium triangle, right? Um, of course, the lithium triangle as a concept is just a later variation of many other similar colonial and extractive concepts. Uh, for example, the Atacama, as I believe uh, Ignacio already mentioned, uh, that used to be called the Despoblado, you no, know, the, with no people, uh, the empty place. Um, and uh, <coughs> let's say communities would refer to this more often as the Puna de Atacama. Um, but the fact is that today the triangle does exist. Uh, it landed in the region, so to say, uh, as a device of epistemic erasure. Um, this idea of triangle is central. The simplification that it provides is central to draw financial interest, to open the way for land grab, for plunder, for environmental destruction, and for human rights violations. So these kinds of uh, discursive semiotic operations are at the core of colonial uh, epistemic violence since since ever, actually. And they're complemented by related racist conceptual tools that are deeply ingrained in the legal and normative systems that adjudicate extraction uh, across the world, uh, not just in Chile, of course. Um, and at a certain point, I was interested uh, in, uh, in, the in the continuities between, okay, the continuities between um, echoes, sorry, between was it me? B uh, continuities between uh, ecocide and genocide, and between the violence and, let's say, uh, the open veins and the circulation of blood from the earth and its relation with the blood of people. 
Um, to the left, uh, we have an image of Fidel Castro when in 71, after the election of Salvador Allende uh, and the nationalization of copper mining, which in, in fact was a process that was coming before from, uh, from the government of Frey. Um, but I, uh, Fidel came to visit Allende in, in the Atacama, and this is a picture in the Tukicamata, which was a major copper mine in the world. Um, and it, where at this point he did a speech where he compared it uh, as a monument to the Chilean workers, he compared it to the pyramids uh, in Egypt, uh, except this is an inverted pyramid. And to the right there's a, an image, you can't really see it very well, but there's some dashed lines. So it's an image from above into the Chukicamata copper mining complex. It's actually a series of, of mines that span around 30 kilometers. What I've tried, part of a sequence of drawings where I tried tracing uh, the movement that Fidel Castro did in Chile when he came to visit, visiting the, the different copper towns and mining towns. And the movement done only two years after, uh, in 73, after the coup d'etat, by uh, what came to be called as a caravan of death, uh, which was a, gr a military group who were tasked with, and I quote, expediting uh, judicial uh, procedures. Uh, and with two years of difference, uh, the movement was very similar. Um, I was also in, uh, interested, and, and I continue always to be interested to understand extractivism, to try to read and, and try to understand the stories that stones and the soils tell and the way that they provide witnessing. Um, this strange image, which can only be seen from above, uh, either from satellite, but more objectively by who produced it by, uh, by airplane. Uh, and it has, it's around 200 meters length, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, carved in the desert, um, resembles um, a type of dagger uh, that is symbolic to fascist military uh, in Chile. And I was interested in particular in the numbers that if you, sorry, uh, let me go back. So to the right of the image, there's numbers as well carved, gigantic, the number 73 and the number 78. Uh, and, and those are particularly relevant dates given that the 73 is the date of the coup d'etat and 78 is the date in which Pinochet um, uh, sent a telegram titled Removal of Televisions uh, ordering the military to exhume the mass graves to erase the erasure. So when we uh, think of extractivism and we think of the lithium triangle, uh, this is the ground uh, in which, let's say, that triangle and through which those triangles and those extractive figures actually operate. Um, and so we can see how the soil and the ground of the lithium triangle, um, and I'll use this uh, actually brilliant image by work that most of you are probably familiar with uh, from Paula Allen, and is an image of who came to be known as the Widows of Kalama, a group of women that for many, many years uh, walked the desert uh, looking for the leftovers of, uh, of their loved ones. And so uh, we can see how the soil, the ground, is in fact inhabited by the ancestors that over time became soil, not just of recent violence, but of a continuum of 500 years of violence. Many of the bodies that perished in this desert can no longer be exhumed. Um, so if the extractive gaze separates people from environments and environments from earths and soils, um, in whatever I do, be it more research-like, activist-like, and etc., um, I try to work as much as possible the other way around towards forms of making a uh, collective with the earth. So, as part of a research that I did between uh, 2017 and 22, Lithium Triangle Research Studio, uh, hosted, uh, coordinated at the RCA in collaboration with several indigenous communities from Atacameño communities and Lekanantai communities from, uh, from, the Acam from the Atacama and also with the Atacama Desert Foundation and, and other people. Uh, we collaborated um, in contexts where communities were trying to claim back their ancestral uh, territories and to claim back their land. Uh, 
And in this case is um, just, sorry, really bad photos that I took of, um, of a report that the community of Tulor, so two, two, two communities, Tulor and Better, uh, which came together to form a, a community claim. So these are two IEUs, so two, in this case, oases in the salt flats of the Atacama, just on top, on the north side of the Atacama salt flat where you extract you know, the main source of lithium at the moment, the main source of lithium production at the moment in the world. Um, and they're trying to claim back their ancestral lands, right? So they commissioned, uh, they're forced to commission, to be better put, uh, an anthropological report uh, which compiled all oral histories. Um, and so from the elders and from uh, everyone in the community, but had to geolocate those oral histories into GPS points. And in here you see the mode by which the community has to claim back the land so that that process can be recognized uh, by the ways in which a state can see, right? And the state can only see with borders and with really precise GPS points for each story, right? Um, and, and so in, in, in this context, uh, we're asked, sorry, I lost track. Um, where was I? Uh, yeah. I, before I say that, I should also say that there's a, a in the context in Chile uh, and in many of these processes, um, mining companies are required, two minutes, okay. That wasn't as short as I thought. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, mining companies are required to go through a process in which they have a social license to operate and an environmental license to operate. So together with, with the process of claiming back the land in an epistemic structure that is in itself violent, uh, you also are forced to operate to, to contest what's happening to your land in separate social aspects and environmental aspects. So most of the work that we've done in, in many ways was actually the sort of work that I would not naturally want to do, which is to use satellites and drones and stuff like that. Um, but that the community asked us to contribute with, because we had the technical skill, not that much the will, um, to contribute with in this format because it, comp it helped complementing ongoing work that they were leading in terms of claiming their land. And so politically there is a certain technical lack which we fulfilled in certain works for certain point. And I won't speak much to the report because it lacks context here, but it's basically what we're trying to complement was, let's say, social and oral testimony with the environmental testimony of, or environmental data of uh, vegetation change, water change, soil temperature changes, so on and so forth, that could allow them in a language recognized by the state, and that is the problem, uh, could allow them trying to make a claim that these two things are not different. Uh, but when, so uh, the core and I'm gonna dump this because clearly it's not made for 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the core, what I'm trying to say is that in, in every process, more research, more activist based, one of the crucial things is how to make alliances, how to work in, at the level of ecologies of research. And to think in terms of ecologies of research practices is not so much that the academic comes or the artist or the architect, whatever, comes and does research. Uh, so, for example, we spent a lot of time here in the farm of Don Raul Chinchilla, who's one of the community leaders from, uh, from, uh, from Tulor. Uh, and this was a moment in which we were having a conversation about uh, the angle of of the corn leaf and the fact that they were not growing as much as they should according to what it was expected. And year after year they're growing less. And so that was one of the moments in which we came to complement that with environmental analysis of vegetation health and so forth. But the actual significant research was done by someone who's there every day doing research. I, the mode of living of someone who cares about corn is research intensive. I, you look at the soil, you smell the soil, you listen to corn, you speak with it, so on and so forth. And so it's these different modes of research that come together. And how do they come together? Through care. Only through care can they jump between what are incommensurable in certain aspects, epistemic modes, but fairly commensurate in a way uh, if you actually care for a certain type of struggle. Um, and I wanted to end with, with 
not with work, because I really, I don't know how to show work and speaking little. Uh, but I, I do know how to, uh, that the, the main thing that I've drawn, both from the work in the Atacama and from the work that I do in Portugal, or with the work in actually my main site of environmental militancy, which is in academic institutions, which is also a site of environmental struggle, is the importance of walking. Um, <coughs> and it f seems probably very simple, um, but wal walking does um, a couple of really important things. Um, one of them is to place our bodies in different positions. The other is to make us tired, and therefore we say less clever things. Um, and that's also very important. Uh, and at that point, we actually start having more meaningful conversations with each other, with the environment. Uh, it allows us to, of course, to cross borders and boundaries. So we're walking here towards Laguna Tevin Kinchi and, and crossing a series of, of borders in the map um, to some sort of purpose. But anyway, um, it allows us to cross borders, um, but it allows us actually to to dream differently. And I think we can have this entire panel just dedicated to dreaming um, and the role of dreams uh, in environmental struggles and in grounding them. So, so all of these things makes walking actually a brilliant form of, of stewardship um, with the awareness that when you walk, you're actually making friends uh, with spirits, with ancestors, and actually with the earth. So thank you. Hi everyone, hi, my name is Gabriella. Nina kindly introduced me before. Um, I'm a student, I'm still a student, I still finished my thesis and everything. Thank you so much for everyone to be here. I'm very thrilled and nervous a little bit. I don't, um, but I'm going to talk about uh, my title for the presentation I suggested is Art as a Catalyst, Exploring Fragility and Activism Through We Are Like Trees Inside the Footsteps of Our Ancestors. So, um, we Like Trees Inside the Footsteps of Our Ancestors is an exhibition that was created by Dr. Mariana Cunha from the University of Westminster, in Westminster sorry, and Dr. Mariana Tsunik from Leeds Arts University. It opened uh, to the public in 12th of May and uh, stayed up until 22nd of July 2023 at the Blaine High Walk Gallery at Leeds Arts University, which is a brilliant gallery. I would suggest you to you know, start to look into it because they're doing a brilliant project there. Uh, the exhibition is part of a wide, as part of a wider research program with the same name and is an ongoing collaborative project. For this presentation, I'm looking at and discussing my reflections on the exhibition, but I hope you, like me, are eager to know more about it and see the outcomes of it. I also am going to address that I'm not part of the project and uh, that I'm still a member of the public and who sees the poetic encapsulation of these exhibitions and understands uh, the potential for this conference to discuss the, how it becomes like a mapping of the disruption of Latin America. Microphone. Oh, I think there's something going on with the cables here. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I move all the time. Um, the, <laughs> you know, walking. Uh, both as mapping and disruption of Latin America, the interconnectedness between humanity and nature, and other things that feel more urgent than ever in the face of escalating environment and crisis, the need of climate justice and extractivism. So this is me going to the exhibition because the oppressive heat of a typical English summer clung me as I step off the train and it was only May, gosh, and then I realized actually it was July when I was in June when I was writing this. But funny enough, Sylvia Carpenter that also wrote a review about the exhibition wrote the same thing at the very beginning, like, oh my God, it was so hot when I went there. So this is probably me texting my mom saying like, it's so hot. I was like very impressed about the heat of it. But when I got there, like I knew that the exhibition was going to be like a full-on process and the dive into a process in, into various project, projects. And this is Marianne Hofmeister's Castro, Marianne Hofmeister Castro, Study of a Beaverness. And Marianne uh, plunges into the heart of a complex ecological disruption. I didn't know, but beavers were introduced to the archipelago of Tierra del Fuego, south of Argentina in 1946. 
to reach the native fauna and foster a fur trade. There are 50 of them. Instead of control behavior that someone thought was possible, or even maybe the possibility of the animals lacking in adaptability, <laughs> they will all thrive and have since spread throughout the archipelago, more recently spreading through the Patagonia as well. The most recent report, oh sorry, I went back. The most recent, <laughs> the heat of the moment. Uh, the most recent report from June 2011 claims that now there are over 200,000 beavers living in the Argentina National Forest and that the beavers have settled and threatening 60 million hectares of forest. So mainly because they produce them, them constructions and they create like pockets of flooded, flooded areas. But uh, to investigate this resurrection, Hofmeister takes a radio radical approach. In a series of short videos, the artist uses her hands, I think it's her hands, I'm not sure, to mimic the gestures of the beavers. At first we can look and think, oh, that's so cute. But by adopting this perspective of the beavers, she introduces, that are introduced into an ecosystem that they are not part of, the artist kind of challenges our anthropocentric view our only human view, and encourages us to consider a far-reaching consequence of human intervention. Through her unconventional portrait of the beavers as protagonists in their own narrative, she challenges us to confront our assumptions about an invasive species and the ecological disruptions that come through because of our actions. As they, inv they are invading, are they invading or are they disrupting? Are we, are we disrupting their life, uh, extracting from their natural habitat, enslaving them and believing that we can control and explore and turn them into a commodity? Does she stop here? No, she doesn't. So Hofmeister goes beyond and proposes an animistic and empathic process. What if we gave space to the beavers to tell their tale? If we could go beyond our incapabilities to communicate with them, uh, would they tell us about their forced diaspora? Would they say the difference between north and south, vegetation and water? The artist extracts the images of the animals carved in the woods and turns them into a typeface. This would be a possible form of communication as they would adapt uh, their gesture into a design that humans can read. Hofmeister then builds up their study of portraying this beaver communication. The artist flips the image or the notion altogether that the animal is an invader to an image of displacement. Who is forced to migrate from one place to another? Why? But what if we learn to communicate with the beavers? What we, of our conversations will be about? Would we teach them about borders? Uh, please don't go up north to the left because it's chilly. Uh, when I had the chance to go through and flip between the pages of the, this book she constructed, I was reflecting and thinking about the idea that was very sort of like uh, heartbroken that I didn't speak beaver, you know, like what we be that. And just like a quick note, because it's like a, like a pun in the process, I'm, I'm, I love TikTok and I'm following lots of animal communicators right now because of this project. And it's very thrilling, of course, they go to domestic pets and things like that, but uh, people are, you know, engaging with them to try to communicate with any, any other animals, and I believe that there are people that, that can do that. So the second word I want to talk about in this presentation uh, is Puchunkavi, and Puchunkavi is a pair of 60 millimeters films by Jeanette Munoz, exhibited in two flat screens in the gallery. The region was known for millennia, being also part of important ancient Inca roads that inter interconnected South America pre-colonization. The captivating videos transport us to exploration of the exploration of the shores of Chile. In Puncho Cavi, large-scale infrastructure projects cast a long shadow over the local communities. We witness the stark contrast between the promise of economic prosperity and the harsh reality of environmental pollution, displacement faced by those who call this land home. The videos also show a series of people of the community, humans and non-humans, passing around the fences and buildings as a regular practice, ignoring them. Are they the factors, maybe, are invader species? Munoz's voyeur-like videos transport us 
to the heart of Latin America's extractivist structures in this uh, backdrop of environmental degradation. Her work serves as a poignant reminder of the disparities between promises of progress, the promise of development, new jobs, access to technologies, blah, 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 and actually determine pollution, loss, loss of identity, and languages. Munoz is strongly, strongly reminded me of Nestor Garcia Canclini's seminal work on cultural studies, hybrid cultures, strategies for entering and leaving modernity, published in 1995. Canclini conveys the idea that Latin America never really entered modernity, but something in between, and that this capacity of resilience, of being alive despite constant violence, aggression, disruption, thrives. And despite all that, Latin America will leave modernity for whatever comes next. Modernity is also a colonial concept. The virtuality portrayed by Munoz's work, uh, as all, all artists in the show, show us the acknowledgement of the fragility of these occupied spaces, and also shows how the ancestral power of adaptability is stronger than the power of colonialism. The power of radical generosity, developing empathic hearing, the position of hungry to learn because of our absolute ignorance when we learn from the indigenous cosmologies, practices, and understandings of the land and the world. But then on the corner of the gallery space, there is a big structure that shows a little door to a room. And you enter it, the screens occupy most of it, leaving us as observers like a small corner, so it's like a takes all over the space. And this is Maya's, Maya Watanabe's video installation, Stasis. Uh, Stasis plays like a sci-fi movie. There is like a forms, and you hear this crackling sound, and you're not in a recognizable place. You don't know exactly where you are. And then we try to understand what we are part of. We are looking to this, and then an eye. The fish eye shows us that we are a testimony to one of the most incredible abilities of the carp fish, the suspension of all the metabolic systems or keeping them alive. The video captures the relationship between life and death and the balancing of how much of much specific systems in the presence of di disruption. By addressing this capacity, Watanabe points this place in between places that we are not capable of achieving as humans. We are not being able to freeze the pace of destru destruction. We are not being able to suspend as the fish the processes of the nature. We do not control it. And the last part of the exhibition, Irreversible by Renata Padova, is a mesmerizing installation. There are long, wide, translucent fabrics hanging like curtains. And we pass through of them at first. Uh, I thought it was like an, almost like a magical reference, like entering some elfic land. Um, and then you move between the fabrics, they move, they make shapes with these superpositions of the images. And then you start to notice that these images are from trees that are some sh somehow materialized because something actually not very good happened to them. They are not alive. They are not part of this place anymore. Two minutes, perfect. Padovan registers these trees pointing to the Balbina hydroelectric dam project in Brazil. The images are like ancient photographs of the death having the part of their bodies held. At the moment, I realized that I was actually in a cemetery. I froze. I had recently just lost someone very close to me and I realized that it was a moment of break. I walk and I cry. I cry for myself, for the loss, for the loss that we have accumulated here. I cry for the need for an artist to take a problematic position to register this place. I cry of the land, of the irresistible and irreparable process of destruction that takes us to this place. From the takes to the exhibition, when I was researching ideas from and for this, or for life itself, I came across this conversation between Ailton Krenaki, a Brazilian indigenous and ambientalist, and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, a thinker, philosopher, called Hama Conversations, from this cycle called Wildlife Study Cycle, in which Castro says, time is ticking, time is running out, we don't have time anymore. And then Krenaki says, White people are interested in accounting for the world. How much world is them to eat? Indigenous people are interested in how many worlds they can create. And then 
Ternaki says, the future is ancestral. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this super interesting um, conversations and trying to um, have different landscapes speak to each other. Um, I, I prepared some kind of, um, yeah, some recent question myself, but I think um, I'm just going to open it up to the floor since we're running a little bit late. I already see two questions. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for really interesting um, uh, presentations, which really also spoke to each other in very interesting ways. Um, two questions, really. First of all, Godofredo, I was I loved your idea of walking and academic militancy, but how do you do the walking? in the acad academic space, you know, I, I'd, I'd like some inspiration, please. <laughs> and then a quick one for Ignacio. Um, I was intrigued, where's the Venus and the Mars? Where does, where does this come in? It's maybe a very obvious question to you, but I'm dying to find out. Um, is this working? Uh, well, there are many ways of walking in the academic space. One of them is out of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and actually, as much as possible, spending time, but I'm, I'm, I'm seriously spending out of it in a literal sense, out walking. Uh, I, I have the privilege of having pedagogical flexibility and being able actually to, to be in different positions with people, uh, not to teach, but actually to create situations, to be, yeah, to, to walk. Uh, and so... But I think there, even if you're constrained by a different type of academic environment or infrastructural possibilities, so on and so forth, uh, I think physically it's really important to remember considering the types of positions our bodies are in. I, I my default cross my leg there, I am doing the intellectual stuff, but the, it's important to consider what the bodies are doing when they're thinking, actually. So as much as it, not just walking, but there are other ways. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think, well, first of all, uh, Venus is, 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 is iron, um, is, and copper represent uh, Mars, and there's a relationship between the Mars and Venus, the two places that are extreme that they have going through this um, mineral exploration. And the project actually started with this kind of belief, that, in, in an animistic belief, that these two places could communicate through the underground and through the obs space observation. So there is kind of analog an analogy of the kind of Mars and Venus copper and iron, yin and yang, the uh, opposite, uh, opposite but interconnected, and the balance and the unbalance that is produced by the, by the, by, by the mining and extractive industries, and then, and then raises questions like, what would we do if there is no more copper, or if we extract all the iron in the, in the, in, and with the energy, and then this is also something that is being followed up in, because conversations with uh, uh, Osa and Yane, which is a very close collaborators in, in, in Kiruna, and then they're healers, and then we, and this is kind of based on an animistic belief on connection between places and energies and the power of or I guess. That's the short question. Yeah, time for one more question. Hi, um, my name is Sagar. My, my interest is coming from an investor space. I'm not an investor myself, but I listen to a lot of um, people who are investing money into resources, into minerals, and they're saying for the last 12 months that, listen, uh, the green space is saying that we've got to divest from fossil fuels because they're harming the planet, so where's the money? We need to invest in copper, we need to invest in bauxite and cobalt. And I'm listening to that and thinking, well, I've got a few thousand pounds in the bank account. I don't want to keep it in the bank account because they're going to steal my money. I don't want to keep it in or invest it in lithium because I know what's happening in places like Peru. But then I ask myself, um, when they're saying that this is the money, the money is in the copper and the cobalt and the bauxite. And at the same time, they're saying, we don't agree with these green solutions, but we want to put our money where the investment is. So my question is, when one of the speakers said that this is due to climate change, I would like to invite some sort of correction, which is, is this due to climate change or is this due to the global north's misled or misguided appetite for going green. And to go green 
it uses and needs huge tons of fossil fuels to be burned in the global south to extract all these minerals and the forestation and everything to give us what we think is green in the global north, but it's actually leaving people in, whether it's in South America or India or Africa, completely disparate. So is this requiring a much deeper conversation? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not a specialist. I so I, I, I don't know. <laughs> we can all speak to it. I, I think you're. I, I think you're right. I, I would. I would say that the way to the way that I understand the the, the green transition is, and the way that several movements actually actively engaged in in resisting it in the front line, it is more understood as as an energetic expansion. Right, in the sense that you're adding, you're not actually replacing. <laughs> you need humongous amounts of copper for your lithium-based car, nonetheless. So there, you're not. Uh, there's really significant lack of, even at the policy level, uh, ways of understanding the of ways of understanding of implementing something that would be some sort of a transition what there is is a, an expansion of the extractive frontier into new sites of profit but that expansion of the extraction frontier that's relying not just on the global south but also in europe expanding throughout whatever serbia germany portugal spain so on and so forth uh, towards whatever in the world we have rare earth minerals so it's an expansion uh, and so I, I think i would agree with you and i would frame it in those terms Thank you all very much.